And so it is live. So welcome to uh, conversation number nine. Uh, I see Brad Miller just chimed in already. So I can I can see that too today. Look out. Conversation number so cool. He's in his car on his way home, listening from the new lockdown. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, Brad Miller. Nice to see you. Um, so today we've been doing this 19 conversation series, right, where we're just sitting down with people and trying to distract everybody from the normal news by talking a little bit guitar. And so today we have Brian Stabell from uh, Howling Monkey Guitar Picks. So how are you doing, Brian? Hey, guys. I'm doing good. Hope you guys are doing okay. <laughs> As he coughs, yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's fine. You'll be fine. Uh, it, for you. It's crazy. Every time you cough, now you think. Yeah, it's it's just in time for allergy season, right? I was just in Atlanta and I had a black car down there, and it looked like I drove down a dusty road. So, you know, it could be any sneeze, any cough, you could be like shunned. <laughs> I know it's hard to say is that it is the worst time of the year to uh, have a cough at all. <laughs> that and I, just the stigma behind it, you know. That right? I, not alone uh, the paranoia. I was talking to my wife earlier today, and I said this is the time when spring fever and cabin fever collide. You know, everyone wants to get out, and nobody's supposed to be out. So, I see Vic Sundown just joined in. Yeah, he says hi. This is Clint. Love these picks. Got some in the mail today. Sweet, okay. sweet. And Lightless cool. Guitar Daddy's in the house too. Nice. So Vix must be one of your uh, customers. Yeah, uh, Clint. I think I know Clint. Yep. Uh, he's uh, ordered for me a bunch of times. So, thank you, Clint. Awesome. So, let's um let's just jump right into the picks, and I can we can show what we have. Uh, I have this. I don't know. I can maybe switch my camera and get a little bit better view of. <laughs> I've already put them in an Altoids tin, so that means they're keepers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to switch this camera just for a minute here. So the ones that you sent me, well, first of all, we got the stickers, and, and Pat, I always like when stickers come. Yep, I try to do that. Uh, I like your little sustainable uh, packet that you're shipping the picks in. Thought that was Thank really you. cool. Yep. And then I have – and why don't you, Brian, help me out? So here's the first one we're going to throw. Uh, that is my primate. Oh, which no. is an undyed Tagua guitar pick. Uh, it has a very light grip on it with my logo. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the most basic guitar pick uh, in my line, but it's a standard shape, um, just like your, you know, any other guitar pick, a 351 shape. Um, that's what it's modeled after, and uh, it's also the cheapest in my line. Now we, use, we have this one. That is my standard guitar pick, uh, what I call it, and that has my uh, proprietary grips on both sides uh and it's uh carved with this uh it's not too heavy of a grip uh but that one is dyed you can get that in blue or red and that is the same shape uh standard the blue one that you're pulling up there is called the fatty which is basically a standard pick with just a little bit of a wider shoulder uh and a little bit sharper shoulders as well uh and comes out a little bit more of a, a wide angle there. Uh, a lot of bass players like that pick and people who like a little bit bigger of a pick, but not too big uh, like that. That is my favorite right there. That's uh, the Fat Jazz. Uh, that is right in between a standard size guitar pick and a Jazz 3. Uh, again, that still has my uh, proprietary pistol grips uh, on both sides. And uh, that is uh, it, it, that one's just a good pick all around, whether you're doing strumming or uh, lead play. I can't get the light right, so you can see this. That's better. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. But, uh, do you have Do you have more, Jason, or do I have? The rest no, you have back? the rest. So, so I'm gonna get rid of this camera while you do that. In our oh, hold on a I'll put you up. I don't know if I everything to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm we got three get, more. All right, there you go, Pat. There we go. So we have three more. Um, so Jason split the pack up, put them in a Ziploc baggie, uh, drove by my house, sprayed <laughs> everything down, threw it out the window, and I grabbed it. And um, so I have this one, maybe a little bit more triangular. Yeah, that's called the Triacus. Oh, look at me. Those the pistol grip is really cool. It's not like you said. It's not like super invasive or you know um, there. And I have this this one. Sorry. That's a standard. Yep. That's okay, standard. that's what I thought. And then the one, um, sorry, I just dropped. I just dropped a pick. Your picks are droppable. You need to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So uh, uh, then this one, which yeah. um, Jason didn't give me the one that said that you're a favorite, but he knows that I play with a Jazz 3 or maybe a yes, Dunlop. Yes, three. I yeah. actually, not to show the competitor, but I do the Dun, 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 Dunlop Eric Johnson signature. Yeah. And then beautiful. when we got little mini plectrums made for the show, they came out that size oh, too. Beautiful. So, <laughs> so I'm curious to try the one that you said was your favorite because I don't have yeah. it. But I did play with the one that was probably closest to the Jazz Three for me. Yeah. And I and I really I really liked it a lot. Um, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I really like uh, the I, I like the grip on them a lot. That's really yeah. nice. I mean, you can feel it under your fingers while you're playing, but it like but it's, it's not harsh, right? Like I think. I don't want to say too many like the competitors, but like the one that's really grippy would be like the snarling dog brain picks. I don't know if you ever picked up any of those. Mm -hmm. Those ones, I, I like those. Those are what I started out on when I was like, I need better grip. So I, I'm not knocking them by any means. Uh, but like it's a, it's almost like a sandpaper grip um, mm -hmm. where it actually has, you can, it, it actually kind of, if you squeeze too tight, it actually hurts a little bit. Um, but, um, so I, I wanted something in between that when I was designing these, um, and this is, you know, kind of, uh, and the other problem is too, is Tog was a very slippery material. So if you play with that natural one, the primate, the one that's not dyed, mm -hmm. uh, and doesn't have a grip, it's going to take a while for the pick to warm up. Um, and before that happens, it's going to be a bit slippery. Um, so na the natural, um, properties of Tog were, is it they, they are slippery and I needed to put a good grip on this in order for it to not be slipping out of your hand, uh, regardless of, uh, of grip itself. So, so yeah, I don't know. Okay. I was going to say, I don't know, like I'm going to segue into like how you started or how you picked yeah. the Tagwa, whichever, yeah. which, uh, you know, a chicken or egg, I'm not sure which, yeah. right? Like, yeah. cause you know, we've talked to pedal manufacturers like, Oh, how did you decide to be a pedal manufacturer? But a pick manufacturer, you are, our first oh, so just cool. kind of curious to know like how you get into that what was the genesis of that how did you pick the, you know the it's material i um i never set out to start a guitar pick business by any means um i had never before starting this i had never even made anything physically like in a shop of any kind um there was a uh i was working at uh a music store in the uh, hometown where I grew up in Batavia, New York, um, which is right between Buffalo and Rochester and small, you know, mom and pop shop. Oh, it's been open for like 80 years or so. I was a marketing director there for a few years. And, um, uh, well, another business in town sells Tagua. Um, and they just happened to be the ones that would come by and pick up our boxes that they could use in shipping. So as you know, it's like in a, in a music store, you got guitar boxes coming in and out, you know, so they were basically coming in to take our boxes so that they can recycle them to ship their products all over the world. And uh, one of the guys came in and brought in a piece of Tagua and said, I've heard people make guitar picks out of these. Um, here's a couple slices. See what you can do with them. And so I said, ah, what the heck? And at that time, I just happened to have my father's, uh, my father was a woodworker and uh, I just brought a couple uh, slices up there and started tooling away. And the next thing I know, I started having, um, bringing them to a couple of my customers at the store and saying, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? You know, uh, you know, and they would give me feedback, change this, change that, I think you should do this. And I did. And then I started selling them and I just kept selling them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And then it came to the point where I thought, you know what, this is kind of fun. I enjoy what, what I'm doing here. I enjoy the conversations I'm having with people. Um, so I started to really make a business out of it and create a brand. And uh, I mailed some off to Guitar World. And I literally, at that time, it's funny looking back at it. It was like seven years ago. Um, I had probably only had 20 guitar picks in stock when I mailed, uh, when I, wrote to Guitar World and said, hey, can you do a feature on me? <laughs> you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was just this guy in a one bedroom apartment making them, you know, um, here and there, like at five at a time. Um, and they were nice enough to do a nice feature on me. And after that, it was all down the hill from there. I was like, holy crap, I'm, I'm legitimate now. <laughs> they gave me some, some real press. And yeah. uh, you it, dropped a it, shark in the tank there. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was kind of cool. And, uh, it's seven years later now, almost eight, and I have about 17,000 guitar picks that I've made so far. So, uh, wow. And, you know, as 
just like any job that you have is that you learn on as you go and you pick up little tidbits here and there and you try and talk to people and you try and make the best product that you possibly can. And, um, that's one of the things that I've always, uh, held in the back of my mind is one is I, I constantly want to be improving on my process and how to make picks. And two is I always want to put the customer first. I always listen to everybody, uh, what suggestions they have for me. And that's been like since day one and will continue for the foreseeable future. So, so what's the process? Like you said, you started out with maybe your father's woodworking tools. I'm assuming that's not what you're doing now. So how has the process evolved? How do you, well, I don't know if you go again, starting with the material and then going through. Yeah. Let me, um, let me see if actually uh, hold on one second. I'll be right off screen here for a second. All right. Down here in the chat, Vic's, uh, so who did that? Clint said that seventeen thousand picks is. <laughs> he said, "Holy crap!" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's it really is it's close to that. Um, so let's. I'll show you the whole process. You want me to start there? I know. I yeah, I'm gonna make yeah, you, sure. I'll make you full screen so people can see that a little bit easier that are that are watching. So this is the tagua cluster that grows in a palm tree in Ecuador. And inside each of these um, clusters is the tagua seed. So I'm going to show you a different one here. So this is like, basically think of that as like a coconut that grows way up in a tree, uh, falls off or gets chopped off, and then it comes to the ground. And then they split up all those clusters. And then in the clusters are the seeds. You can see them here. Mm. And then the seeds are like this. Um, and then from the seed, they get sliced up. And this is what my raw material is that I work with um, here at, at the shop. So they all come in different. Every single piece is like a, a snowflake, if you want to call it that. They're all different shapes, thicknesses. Um, you can't really um, automate the process too much because um, each, as you can see, like those are the two different slices that I'm working with. Uh, it's not like working with um, sheets of plastic or, you know, sheet goods where it's easy to, you know, everything's consistent across the board. Um, it's very manually intensive to get from a slice of tagua to the guitar pick. Um, so uh, as far as the process goes, I did start out with tracing, you know, a Dunlop Tortex on a tagua. buffing it up and then from there it was you know using sanding equipment and really it hasn't changed a whole ton uh it's gone from using a bandsaw to cut the shape and then um i used to put angled grooves in it rather than the pistol grips that you see and i used to do that with a saw by hand over and over uh, which was inconsistent at best and uh did lead to a lot of breakages in the picks you can get to that later uh, but with that, um, the I have moved to laser. Um, so I have uh, Epilogue Mini sitting right next to me right now, and um, that I, I load up, you know, 60 slices into my machine, and that cuts the shape um, exactly where I want it. And that I also use that machine to cut the grooves. I have a kind of a cool way that I do that um, that I don't want to get into. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to have to kill us. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't. I, I really. Uh, uh, I'm sure that if you know anybody were using lasers, they could figure out what I'm doing. But uh, it's it's not total rocket science. But at the same time, it's something that uh, I, I kind of put a little feather in my cap that oh, I did that. Figured that out. That uh, I'll do that. I used to use a CNC machine uh, before I went to laser, and that was a bear. Um, because you had to worry about changing blades and uh, the CNC machine that I was using wasn't uh, all that consistent and especially putting the grooves in the picks, you know, the thickness, even like a half a millimeter um, of a, uh, a thickness difference would make a difference in um, how deep the grooves would go. Um, it was, it, that was quite a, uh, a process. Uh, can I, but can now, I Yep. Go ahead. I just want to back up and ask you a question. So, do you get the entire nut, the seed, and you slice that, or you get the slices? No. So, um, if you can see this nut here, um, yep. you can actually see it at, at this end. I'll show you. Um, I'm trying to figure out where my camera is here. I'm very yeah, bad it's, all it's all backwards. So we're saying yep. with us. Yeah. So, there's, see that hole there? Um, yep. 
sometimes that hole goes through the entire nut. Um, Tagua itself, when it falls off the tree, the nut, this, this white part here, is the consistency of jello. So if it were to come right off the tree before it was dried, you slice it in half and you can spoon it out. You can't eat it. You could eat it, but you don't want to. Um, and so you can spoon it out. And when the drying process can happen, there can be air pockets that happen. And that would produce a crack in the nut. Um, so I allow, you know, I don't allow, I, I want the people down in Ecuador and Colombia who are farming these to get rid of those things for me. So if I were to take these nuts and not know that there was a hole straight through the middle of it, if there was, this whole nut would be done. Yeah. And I would, I would lose, I wouldn't even be able to make a guitar pick out of it. Right. Um, so I allow them to do all of that down there. So when I get my Tagua slices, um, there's no holes in them. Okay. There could be some stress fractures in there due to some air bubbles that happen um, in the drying process, but we try and weed those out up here. They do down there a little bit, but I also do that here in shop. So by the time you get it to that point and you're putting it in the laser, you have very little waste at that point, right? Like they're pretty stable. Yep. They're, they're yeah. what you want. So you don't have a lot yep. of waste once you get to that part. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And so, down there, as far as when we were talking about waste, is um, they make Tagua into all sorts of things. Um, so those nuts that have holes and cracks in those, those end up becoming jewelry. Mm. Um, so they carve those those um, cracks out of there, and they like have circles, you know, well the Tagua and the, what's left to, that get made into jewelry or ornaments or all sorts of different things. So a lot of the Tagua pieces are completely used. Because did I read that? That it maybe has some of the same characteristics of ivory. Is that true? You got it. Okay. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So a lot of the um, counterfeit ivory that you might see in the world is actually top. <laughs> um, not that probably many of us have ever come across like, oh, that's imitation ivory. <laughs> right. you know? like, uh, that's a cubic uh, zirconia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, back in the day, uh, before plastics were uh, ubiquitous in the country, for you know production processes, um, your buttons were Tagua. Okay. So all the button factories, you know, before the 1920s, um, Tagua was uh, used for buttons. Oh, wow. Yeah. But as far as the ivory goes, um, yeah, there's a sustainability on that end is that uh, we, as far as like the guitar pick tone goes, it is the closest to an ivory um, material, mm -hmm. but it's 100% sustainable. Cool. Yeah, I love that. I mean, being an environmental science teacher at, at times, oh. um, I, yeah, I love that. I love that sustainability factor uh, around the company, not just in the nuts that you're getting, but also in the packaging. And then you said, too, that it's fair trade, right? So yep. I mean, maybe talk just a, a minute about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the fair trade um, in regards to that is uh, the, it's a whole industry down in Ecuador and Colombia. Uh, last time I knew there were about 1,800 farmers that farm these and produce these um, into various things, whether it's um, ornaments or uh, like I've got something from them here too. I'll show you a um, little dolphin. See that? Oh, uh, so that comes. That's, that looks like ivory, right? But that, mm -hmm. that's completely tagua on a Tagua base. It's very cool. Um, so they make things like that down there and then they ship those all around the world. Um, Tagua jewelry. If you go on Etsy right now and search Tagua necklace, you'll see, I don't know, like 10,000 results. Um, and as far as the uh, farming goes with that, um, who I buy through, um, they pay them, you know, fair trade wages and they're under fair trade working conditions as well. So um, it's not like a sweatshop or anything like that. So which have is, you been able – go ahead, Jason. I was going to say, which is really, really important because, you know, whether people realize that or not, like because we're destroying the rainforest so fast. Yeah. and But they have – you know, if you can come up with a product that's made in the forest that people can get paid to make a living off of that's sustainable in the forest, then they want to keep it as yep. opposed to chop it down and grow, you know, crops on it for a year or two yeah. or whatever. Very yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. So you're saving that. the rainforest. If you buy a pick from Alan Monkey, you're actually saving the rainforest. Yeah. I don't like to go that far, but I, you, you, you really are. 
Um, I, I, I think you're you're onto something there, definitely. Yeah, that marketing tip is free. The rest of cost you. <laughs> so I was going. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask. You, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a smaller. Just, just for, so you know, there's a smaller version of our logo that fits nicely on a pick. Just saying. <laughs> Next time I should be out to pick, so I'll roll up on it. Yeah, we should. Probably, we well, should hey, that's pay. a that's a great segue because one of the things that you do on the web. So let's pull your website up real quick while we're talking about that. Uh, give me one second to do that. All right. So one of the things you do on the website is this idea of personalized picks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that was something I've, I've started very early on in my in my starting at Holly Monkey was being able to create gifts for people um, and have you know band logos and whatever else, and people be able to personalize themselves. So. Uh, yeah, that's that's a fun part about my website. It used to be a bunch of years ago. It used to be my primary part of Howling Monkey. I mean, I was definitely selling the guitars, but a lot of it was personalizing the guitar pick. That was a good chunk of business. Um, in 2018, I switched over and I decided to go full full bore at the guitarist, and uh, that's been working out pretty well so far. So we just saw Jay Steen pop in the the chat. Just want to welcome him. Not and one thumb, not one thumbs up, not two, but three thumbs up. Right. Yeah. And then I want to point out, and I don't know, uh, Brian, if you if you're looking at your Streamyard, if you click live comments up there on the right, you can see comments that would be coming in from. Uh, the yeah, other thing, yeah. I, I noticed your boxes and stuff like the gift boxes, and I saw that and and recognized it, those are laser cut as well. I'm assuming. Yep. And so when I saw those, because being a teacher, we we have so we have a laser cutter at the school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I was thinking this that. That, that's I, mean, I think it's amazing, like the uh, using that to put in those pick grips and things that you were talking about. I love, by the way, just to add, I love the colors, especially like Pat said about dropping a pick earlier. That blue just jumps yeah, out. And it's oh, right. yeah, yeah, red yeah. Cool, but the blue, blue, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and so a little bit further on that, um, as far as like the laser goes, uh, Holy Monkey is my primary business, or was started out as my primary business, and that was the first business that I started 100% on my own. And from Holly Monkey, um, I actually have a full service laser engraving business too. So mm -hmm. I'm running two businesses concurrently. Um, uh, so like I do, you know, cutting boards for mortgage companies and you know, putting logos on glassware or Yeti cups and things like that. So I am running two businesses. So between those two, this is my full time job. And that that's uh, the the laser thing isn't because I played around when they when they kind of converted they got they they got three D printers and lasers uh, a laser engraver and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I played around on that laser cutter trying to figure that. That is, it's not as easy as you'd think. It's not just a matter of punching a few buttons and cutting something no. out. Yeah, it's it, it's an easy thing to get into. It's a really hard thing to master to really get um, one. Every material is different and has different settings when you put it into a laser engraver, laser cutter, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, even if you're engraving pine, uh, the the grain on the pine might different. Um, you might have to change your settings just by the grain um, and how tight the grain is. Um, and it's, it's all different. Um, and that it, it just takes some time and practice. And I've got logs of, you know, basically journals of settings and things like that, the, all the different materials that I've, that I've worked with. And um, you kind of just ballpark it at some points um, and you, you go from there. And it just takes time and time and time and time again. The more you use the laser engraver, the more comfortable you are with it, and the more um, experimental you you can come, become with it, and the more efficient you can become too. I thought you were going to tell me it was so easy that a monkey could do it, but not so much. <laughs> so, so what's the general? Well, if I can do it. Anybody can. Yeah. Well, for that, there's hope for me. That's helpful. Uh, I mean, I, I was going to ask about the genesis of the company name. I didn't know if it was like. You know, monkeys live in the palm trees, and they set the alarm when people try to come get the get the nuts. But <laughs> what's the genesis of the company? The genesis, it's is it, it's stupid to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna love it then. <laughs> so, if you remember back, I I graduated college in the early 2000s, um, and if you remember back then, there was like 
a lot of different types of commercials that had monkeys in them. Uh, and I have a marketing degree. Um, and <laughs> I said to my roommate in college uh, one night, and I said, you know what? And we were watching one of these commercials with monkeys, and I said, monkeys could sell anything. And I said, I swear, <laughs> I'm going to have a monkey in every commercial I ever have. And every chance I get, I'm about to put a monkey in it. And uh, uh, like 10 years later, that's what I was doing. <laughs> so really, I, it, the howler monkey is native to South America. Um, okay. And the howling monkey is just, I wanted to put an action based on that. So that's the real um, boring answer to that part of it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it does, it is related to where the pigs come from. Yeah. Um, and uh, monkeys can sell anything. So, Jason, that's good. That's good news because um, older than you, but our name. We're trying to pick a name is the hardest thing in the world, right? Um, yeah, it is. ours. Our, ours is a derivative of a monkey. It's a kind of a spoof on BJ and the Bear, the show. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. so right. we have we have a monkey. We've got some kismet going here with the monkeys. So right. we're going to be huge. <laughs> 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 so, Jason. Very cool. Did you want to segue to his artist? And ask yeah, yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking that we could. Um, I'm gonna have to share my screen again, but we we uh, were looking at, or Pat was looking at uh, your artist page, and so one of the things we've been doing on this 19 conversation things is I shared your web page again. Okay. See, can't can multi task. It's hard to get uh, up. One of the things we've been doing is looking at like for some artists that are kind of under the radar that we're not really uh, maybe super familiar with that kind of thing and sharing those. And so in looking at your artist page, Pat, um, this guy right here, Pat, you want to give your spiel about him? Well, I just thought it would be great to just kind of go through and, and kind of see who the endorsees are. And I got to take a trip down some paths I'd never been. And so um, Frank bang was one of the artists and, I was going to surprise Jason live on the broadcast, but I'm going to say it to you all. When I looked him up, you know, he's a blues player um, from Chicago, I believe. And he, he was in uh, Buddy Guy's band for five years. And so I'm like, so I went down a YouTube rabbit trail and tried to find some, some stuff that would be great to feature his playing. And I personally like this clip. We've been playing like 30, 40 seconds of a clip. And so I found uh, this this clip and playing in a three piece with an unbelievable rhythm section here. So this is oh, yeah, the rhythm sections. <laughs> yeah, right. Unbelievable, right? Yeah, yeah. So let's I've had the pleasure. Go ahead, you can play. I'll I'll talk about it after. Yeah, All right, we'll do that. <laughs> Yeah, rhythm section is tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Frank's a monster. Um, I mean, real true Chicago blues, 100%. Uh, as you said, I mean, he 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 actually grew up, you know, like when he was starting out as a uh, as a musician, he really grew up under um, Buddy Guy's wings, um, and he took him on the road with him. It, and some stories that Frank has told me before. Uh, I, he's come up to Rochester a couple times, and I've actually been able to see him live a few times. And that he he's brought a couple different bands with him when I've seen him. And no matter what he brings, he brings a killer rhythm section. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he's told me some stories and some cool things. And he's he's a great dude, a great musician, and uh, he's going places. He's based out of Florida right now, um, Fort Myers area, I believe. And uh, he, he plays all around. Well, he usually plays around. You're right, uh, right. I feel bad for all the musicians out there right now. I honestly do. But um, he's down in Florida touring around there, but he gets up into the Chicago area and tours up the East Coast uh, pretty much all year long. And uh, he's uh, was nice enough to um, – he played a big blues festival in Las Vegas that he handed a bunch of my picks out to. Um, so shout-out to Frank for uh, – 
getting my picks in some hands of some big players out there. Uh, he's been a big supporter of mine, and uh, he's a great dude. Sweet. I will say this. If you cut your teeth playing with Buddy Guy and turn around, but I mean, I <laughs> – I, I make a prediction. Having having learned to play guitar on a stage with a bunch of the old local Pennsylvania blues musicians, and actually getting a chance to meet some other guys, you know that that tour around and stuff. Being on stage with Buddy Guy is probably not an easy job. Like you got to be right. <laughs> yeah. Those guys. How old is Buddy Guy now? 81, 82, something like that. Something like that. Man, like since he's been what seventeen, eighteen years old. I mean. He's seen every guitarist in the world play, you know, and I'm sure you got to be on your spot or otherwise he's probably uh, on you. <laughs> I'll get out the door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a great, if you watch uh, the, the tribute, they did a tribute to Stevie Ray Vaughan video. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that a few years ago where all the guys that played with him the night that he died went back. And so there's yeah. a story behind my first, time that I really saw Buddy Guy and was just like, oh my gosh, I need to know everything about this guy, was on that video. And he walks out and he just starts playing. And so the story is that I read somewhere is, you know, Buddy went there, rehearsed the song that they were going to do. And then when he walked out live to do the song, he started playing something completely different. And you watch, <laughs> he doesn't turn around and go, hey, everybody, we're in E, it's a slow blue yeah. from the five. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's like, he well, playing. maybe you're going nowhere. <laughs> he starts playing, you figure it out. So I mean, <laughs> if he's been touring with him, that's off to him. You know, that's like, awesome. yeah. So there's another are... video if you're searching online uh, of any of Frank Bang's stuff and Buddy Guys. Uh, it's a really cool one. I believe he's playing in Europe. I can't remember exactly where, uh, but Buddy Guys, you know, obviously the you know the guy at the mic, and then he hands it off to Frank. Um, and not just a solo, like he's playing a song and like, dude, I was like, holy cow, that's huge. You know, the, the buddy guy to hand off the stage to, to the second guitarist is, um, you know, something to be said. So, uh, kudos to Frank Bang for, uh, being such a killer guitarist and, uh, you know, getting, getting there with buddy guy. Well, one, and when I was watching that video and now it makes total sense now that you tell me this, Pat. <laughs> um, even in this, I cry out your name video that we were watching. I'll throw the link down in the chat if anybody wants to go watch the whole thing. But one thing I noticed about the band, very dynamic, they get really big, they get really small, they're back and forth. And I love that. I mean, that speaks volumes yeah. of a band that can do that. And that is buddy guy through and through, right? <laughs> oh, like absolutely. I've seen him several times. And I, one of the, actually the first, one of the first times my wife and I went somewhere together was at a buddy guy concert and she bought the ticket. So I knew she was a keeper right then, but, um, that night he was playing or somewhere else I played him, you know, he likes to get the band to drop totally down. We're in a live venue. It gets down to where you can even hear the amps humming. And then he has a pretty, you know, dynamic line where he's like, I love that. Shit. You know, it's just kind of gets all buddy guy on you. But yeah, like the yeah. guy is, you know, brilliant and he's played with everybody on the planet. And uh, so that's really yeah. cool that, 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 so who else is on the roster? There's, there was like, I think on your website, five or six other. Yeah. So there's, uh, just recently I added, um, Paul Delarius, and if we're talking about uh, blues, I am probably butchering his last name, uh, but uh, he is a big blues musician up in Canada, uh, Montreal he's out of, and he's uh, unbelievable, um, right along the lines of Frank Bang as well, but um, he just won uh, Toronto uh, Blues Society's Best Guitarist, uh, his bassist just won the same thing, um, big uh, he, he's a he's a killer. He's really good. He, he just uh, got added on about two weeks ago. Um, thanks to Frank Bang again. And then another one, um, Ray Earls uh, from a band called Green Jello. Do you guys know those guys? You, have you ever heard of that band at all? Mm -hmm. um, it's a punk rock punk rock puppet show, <laughs> is what it is. Um, if you they're along the lines of Guar. Okay. If you will, yeah, right. um, they wear crazy costumes on stage, um, and they have weird songs of all different types. Um, but um, Ray Earls, who's out of California, he's one of the band members uh, in Green Jello, and he, he signed on with me recently too. And he's a fun guy. Uh, he wears a full duct tape um, suit on stage that's bright green. So what's um, his pick? What's his pick like? Uh, he likes the standard and the okay. triacate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nice. yeah, yeah, that's his favorites. So, 
Uh, he's a good guy. Um, and then there's Matt Hendershot, who just moved to Germany. He was in an independent band. He was in New York City for a long time. Uh, he it was in a two piece band. They were kind of like a Black Keys, White Stripes style. Uh, very cool stuff. He's um, he's doing some other stuff now that he's in Germany now. Uh, doing actually more of uh, playwriting and things like that. Um, oh. Scoring for plays in Germany for um, English speaking plays in Leipzig, I think it's pronounced. <laughs> um, and then Matt King is a country guitarist. He's really good. Um, he he's been around for quite a while and he's actually about to marry Heidi Newfield who's um, she was uh, in the um, top 100 a long time ago for a song called Benny and June uh, if you're yeah. from the movie or? Um, no um, it was a song that hit the top 100 mm -hmm. charts a while back big country stuff so they're they're in the country stuff um, and uh, so yeah we're we're plugging away I'm pretty selective about the people that I bring on to my um, artists. Um, and uh, it really comes down to a few things. One is that they've got to really understand what I'm doing here. Um, it's not just that, hey, I want to get some free picks. You know, it's got to be, you know, your, your understanding of the sustainability and the cool, um, the Tagua and everything along that lines. You, you uh, have to um, be willing to, be open to helping each other out. I call it a um, artist family for a reason. Um, you know, if you need referrals for you know venues in California and you're from Pennsylvania, you know, um, I'll get you in touch with my guy out in California. See if he can't help you out. Um, I try and do that as much as I possibly can to connect our, our guys together. And, and um, I also have to like the music. Uh, and I know that's a very subjective thing, <laughs> but uh, I got to like to do. And uh, I require that if I like their stuff i'll call them and talk to them and if they're cool people then i will but if i feel you know um they're not the right fit then so be it All right um so uh, I, I don't accept everybody and i i hope i don't sound like a jerk when i'm saying that um but oh. i really feel like um having a, a select group of people uh helping me out and helping the brand out and um being a part of it um really helps out yeah i mean absolutely I mean, it's your brand, right? Like you, yeah. They're 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 out representing you then, in in some regards, exactly. in some regards, you know. Yeah. But yeah, um, that's really cool. Yeah. I was going to ask you yeah. earlier, um, for uh, when you 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 forge relationships with your suppliers, right? Have you been able to go down and visit them and made relationships with anybody? Or? My, my wife and I keep talking that it's going to be a trip uh, eventually, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to write it off as a business. My wife's a CPA. There you go. <laughs> so she's trying to uh, figure out a way to you know make that an easy thing to do to take a vacation down to Ecuador and uh, meet my suppliers and then write the expense off. And you, uh, I hope the IRS is this right now, but yeah. You mentioned uh, you mentioned we, Colombia as well. What, what part of Colombia? You know, where they're coming from. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I know the majority of my stuff comes from Ecuador. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'm assuming it, um, if it's coming from Colombia, it's away from the coke field. <laughs> well, yeah. nothing's very far from that stuff in Colombia. <laughs> yeah, I've been yeah. to I've been to Medellin three times, and it's just amazing oh, yeah, yeah. that was previously the murder that's capital cool. of the world because it's not anymore. Um, beautiful yeah. people, but it's just a something that's still part of the element of their lives that they don't want to have part of their lives. So sure. doing things like, and I'll tell you, I'm not to get too deep here, but I'll tell you the things you're doing are wonderful because we visited some prisons when we were there and you would meet people in these prisons that you're like, why are you in jail? Like, like it doesn't, doesn't look like they should be in jail. And it's, that's yeah. just the lifestyle that they knew, right? It was what, what permeated around them. It was yeah. a way for them to make money. Because you know they're they're poor countries, so to yeah, do things yeah. like you're doing yeah. is great. You probably in some you ways are helping to break that cycle a little bit. So yeah. good for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, um, the industry was there before I was there, um, so I don't want to you know take too much credit from it, but um, I'm happy to help in any way that I can in regards to that. Um, what were you doing down there? Is uh, associated with a local college here I graduated from, and um, I work with their soccer team, do broadcasting and things, and so they were mm -hmm. on a playing trip and a missions trip and we hooked up with a group down there that uh coaches soccer as a way also to give guys something to do and these kids something to do they have coaches in like every neighborhood and you know it was in um 
some some places that Pablo Escobar actually built, like some wow. stadiums yeah. and things like that. Just uh, so they're trying to like change that culture down there as well by yeah. giving these kids a chance to play soccer and be a part of a team and Absolutely. have have a leader in their neighborhood that they can look up to. Um, that's that's cool. Uh, I, I think that's such an important thing to uh, keep kids busy as much right. as possible. Um, and off the you know off the streets or off the computer or whatever it is and, and keeping their minds moving and interested in things and i think it's not only important for like the education side of it but uh growth as a human being and um you know, you know having goals and i think having that is uh, a really important thing and i i, I want um the uh you know I, I, like i said i work for a music store um and I watched that the uh, younger kids just weren't showing up like they used to, you know, um, you know, they're not picking up the guitars like they used to. And I'm, I'm hoping that it starts to swing back a little bit. I'm starting to see that a little bit more in some of the mainstream that, um, you know, some movies that people are playing guitars in more and, you know, cartoons and things like that. The music's becoming more of a, a central theme, whereas I think that we lost that a while back. Um, so I'm hoping that um, some of these younger kids start uh, coming back and I'm not against computers or technology or anything like that uh, but right. you know picking up a sport or a uh, instrument is uh, so key for anybody um, especially that age between like 8 and 14 8 and 16 it's so important yeah i think um kind of along a very loosely affiliated thing with what you're saying there but um just uh, last week they did the iheart radio like living room concerts um mm, yeah. and El elton john hosted it or whatever but Kind of to your point, it's interesting because, you know, they go out and see these big produced shows in stadiums and they hear the music. But like every one of those artists was a piano or a guitar, because when you're stripped down, that's what you're doing. So yeah. David, Dave, Dave Grohl, Billy Joe Armstrong, like uh, and then some more of the younger pop artists that I'm not quite as in tune with. There they are in a living room with a piano or a guitar. So yeah. I, I think the more that younger people see that might spark their interest in music and see that like, Oh wow. Like this big, huge produced song could barely be stripped down to a guitar or a piano and might inspire them to play or like write songs or so. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's, that's big. And you got some players like John Mayer and other people who are, you know, big and they can see a guy that can play and he writes really good pop songs for people. And so, yeah. Absolutely. Cool and he's yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Look at everybody chat i don't see anything in the chat right now but there are some people watching if you have questions or you know anything you'd like to know about the picks get, make sure you pop them in the chat i'm sure brian would be happy to answer those yeah i'd be happy to answer anything yeah, absolutely yeah. so part, part of what we've been doing in these 19 conversations is kind of like you know how are you handling our new shared experience that nobody wants to have this shared experience um yeah. you know for you being a a, a small business and yeah. assuming you know, you said the, the laser cutter is near you. You can probably, you probably already have your operation in somewhere where yeah. you can continue on. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm still very fortunate in, in where we are right now. Um, and that I'm generating my own income. I'm not reliant on um, a paycheck. Um, and uh, I, I can, most of my stuff, especially on the guitar pick end is um, uh, shippable. Um, so I'm still shipping and making guitar picks right along and, um, I'm not shutting down. So I'm in fact, um, uh, I'm actually benefiting a little bit. I hate to say it that way, but, um, there are, uh, I've actually had my best month that I've had in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of people are at home and looking to uh, pick up their guitar. Um, and, uh, they, it, it's been, it's been kind of good actually. Um, uh, but I mean, there's definitely some bad things that are along with that. And, uh, you know, I have my, I have family members that I'd like to see some people who are um, ill right now that I can't see. Um, and you know, the, the social end of it is really, really rough. Um, but, uh, as far as like my day to day, um, stuff, it's, it's, it's okay. I have two very small children. <laughs> I have a two and a half year old and a nine month or 10 month old. And uh, that's hard uh, trying to keep them busy because their uh, daycare is closed. Um, mm -hmm. So they're at home 24 seven now. And that's uh, 
my wife is in busy season as a CPA. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sure that, even, with the, even with the July extension, I'm sure there's still a lot. I was just going to say the yeah. July extension definitely helped a little bit, but there's still, you know, uh, clients who are knocking on the door and, um, you know, you have to file your taxes in order to get parts of your stimulus plan. Um, so, you know, a lot of that's happening. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's just the balance here on our end. Um, and luckily that um, the weather's starting to warm up a little bit here too. So we've been able to get outside and enjoy a little bit of sunshine. Actually, today's the nicest day so far. So, um, yeah. So uh, overall, you know, it, things could be way, way worse. Yeah. So when you were talking about working from home, so it reminded me, did we finish, when we were talking about the manufacturing of the picks, we talked about, you know, cutting them out with the laser cutter, putting the, the grips in, the pistol grips in with the laser cutter. Is that the, is that it then, or is there there's another? Oh, no, there actually is a, quite a few more steps right. than that. Uh, so after the laser, then that's where a lot of the hand processing comes from. Um, so uh, sanding equipment, um, I use um, a spindle sander to carve the um, bevels on the sides and all the way around. And then um, uh, basically a Dremel tool to... Um, polish it up and smooth out the uh, the edges even further, and then you know polish up any of the scratches that the tagua may have arrived with when they were processing it in Ecuador. Um, and then from there, then they go into uh, a dye. Um, the ones that do have a dye, they dye they they're in a water based dye for twelve hours. Um, on average and then from there i have to rinse them off very well and then they dry for another 12 to 24 hours uh, before they can be shipped out cool. so, yeah, so start uh, to, so start to finish how long is the process um you're looking at per pick you're looking at about three to four minutes total and i'm not i don't put the dying time into that because um, that's kind of a moot point. Um, I always have, you know, picks ready to go while the other ones are drying and dying. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, about the production time, you're looking at about three to four minutes at most. Okay. And how and many? That includes, that includes the laser too. How many? How many oh, yeah. colors? How many colors? Uh, I do blue and red. I used okay. to have green, and people are angry with me that I dropped green. But I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> it was just it was honestly and it's no joke it was too much of a production issue for me to hold three colors uh, i make in small batches between 30 and 60 uh, picks at a time so when i make you know standard size picks i'm making 30 to 60 and when i'm doing um you know it's a lot easier for me on my end to do 15 blue 15 red you know um, uh -huh. and to try and figure out how many green are going to sell that week is really hard because green is always the third color. So, um, when you got a line of you know ten picks um, that have three colors, it just becomes a little. It just, it, it I'm constantly disappointing my customers. <laughs> um, saying, oh, I'm sorry, green's out today. Can you take a blue? Oh yeah, I will. You know, so I just it, it got to be too much for me on my end. If I were to you know go into a larger scale production, I would definitely consider. Um, putting green back in there and even adding other colors in uh but at this point um for my sanity um blue and red are what i'm sticking with so right. and i do have to mention too is um i have to give a shout out to i don't know if she'll ever see this or not but uh i have an employee carla um she's i hired her a year and or so ago and in the last year or so, she's made pretty much all my guitar picks. Um, so um, shout out to you, Carla. I, I couldn't be doing this without you with my two kids and my laser engraving business. So um, they're, she's making them the exact same way that I make them. Um, so um, the laser part, well, I do the lasering part, and she does all the hand finishing stuff for me. So um, thank you, Carla. It's cool. Being a little bit disingenuous when you said that you um, are constantly disappointing your customers because – just from reading some of the backstory, I, 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 I you know, let you fill in the parts I'm wrong about. But the hand process without the laser cutter took a lot longer. We added the laser cutter, you saved a lot of time, and also you cut your prices in about half, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, time is money, and um, I mean, and I think I was a little bit um, 
even back then I was a little conservative uh, or not conservative um, with my timing on how long it actually took when I was doing CNC. Um, and um, even before that, when I was doing it by hand, uh, I was estimating it probably in like a seven minute range and um, to, to produce one before the dyes and drying. And uh, I think it was probably more like 10 to 12 um, from start to finish. And now I'm down to three um, on average, which is a huge um, difference in time and um, uh, that I wanted to pass that on to my customers. I, I very well could have kept the pricing the same, but um, the two um, things happened. One is I felt that it wasn't fair um, to not do that and two, it was a competitive thing uh, because most guitar picks that are in the boutique handmade market is somewhere between the seven and 10 range and I wanted to be in that, or I should say five, five to 10 and I wanted to be somewhere right in the middle there. So that was a bit of a strategic thing. I know that I'm talking business here, but um, that, that really honestly is where, where it's at between the, the strategy and I wanted to bring that cost down to my customers because there were a lot of customers who were writing me back then. It's like, I, I can't afford a $12 pick. I can't oh, afford a $15 nice. pick. And I, I was felt bad because people did want my product and I couldn't provide it to them because I literally, I wasn't trying to gouge people. I literally had to set my prices there because that's how much time it took me to do it. Um, so when I figured out the laser process and I was able to, to, to cut my time below half, I was so happy that I could bring the pricing down. Right. And I don't think any customer has ever said, wow, you cut the price of your product in half. And I'm, I'm mad at that. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, I'll give up actually, green for a 50% discount. <laughs> and even past that, when I did that and I moved everything over to the laser, the, the consistency went up 30, 40, 50% uh, between picks and, and shapes because now I, I'm, I'm dealing with a, a machine that's very consistent across the board and how, how they're made. Um, and, uh, it, it, it was it was a game changer for me. It really was. And uh, I read comments about, um, you know, lasers not being um, environmentally friendly. And I, I don't see the difference between a laser and a CNC machine, really. Um, like, I, I, sure, there's some chemicals and, you know, science that is involved with a laser. But um, I, and there's some exhaust that happens, but it's very minimal. Cool. I do know lasers burning through certain materials can smell pretty bad. I've well, experienced. Yeah, that. if if you ever have a chance, I don't know if you guys have tools around, um, but go ahead and, um, and, and when you're done using your pick, go ahead and um, sand it a bit and get it kind of um, hot. And it's a really cool smell. Um, the Tagua is. So you're gonna make some candles now? Is that what we're gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> essential. <laughs> It's it's like a it's uh, it smells like a nut, um, and not like a peanut. It's a very unique smell when you get it heated, um, and to me, it, maybe to other people it's gross, but to me, it's like it smells like home to me because you know, I make them at home, so <laughs> it probably smells like that all over. Um, but it, it, it's a really, um, I think it's a very welcoming, cool smell. Um, so if you, if you ever get a chance and you want to uh, destroy one of my picks there, go ahead and uh, take it up against the sander and see what it smells like. So I have a question. Um, I know you talked about you have your engraving business, which that's cool. Are there other guitar-related things that you're considering making with the Tagua? Is there anything else that makes you know, sense? You know, a lot of people, there's two Things that people always ask me, um, it's actually the same question, but it's really, uh, is can you make uh, a nut or a saddle out of the Tagua? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, people have made ivory or bone uh, nuts or saddles. And, you know, it's, it's I always deflect and say no. Um, and the main reason why I say that is, one, is the Tagua nut's too small. Um, you'd have to glue multiple pieces together. Um, in order to get a, uh, a long enough saddle for an acoustic guitar, um, you could probably do it um, for a mandolin, maybe. Um, in the same way with a nut, um, you'd have to have a really solid piece. The second reason why I say no to it is because Tagua is heat and moisture sensitive. So if your guitar is going in and out of, you know, like I'm in New York, my the humidity changes on a daily basis quite a bit, and the the Tagua can react to that. Um, so if you're not really treating your guitar all that well, or you, you're not 
you know, if, if it's going in and out of different environments, you're not, your saddle could crack. Um, right. just because that's your, you, your, your guitar pick won't. Uh, but when you've got X amount of pounds of pressure being put across strings on a top, you know, on a Tagua nut or a saddle, then you're going to start having problems when the mm-hmm. flexibility, um, is, is, um, is happening with, with the, uh, moisture. Right. So okay. I always say no. I met a guy once that said he made a nut um, and out of Tagua, and he said it's had no issue whatsoever. Um, but for me, I haven't had a chance to um, do the R and D on it to uh, bring right. it to production. Right. So I that's, true. No. that's true. That's true because I was thinking about like end pins too. But when you're talking about a nut that's this big, to get an end pin out of that, that's that's going to be a really yeah. Hard, well, use I mean, the resource pretty well. I showed you a couple small tagua nuts. Some of the bigger ones, um, like they can get about you know yay size. So you mm-hmm. can probably get uh, a couple pins out of them. But again, when we're talking about efficiency, uh, yeah. you might be able to get one pin, two pins maybe out of the whole nut. Yeah. So yeah. stick with the, stick with the picks. <laughs> I'm gonna stick with the picks. I'm gonna stick with what I'm good at. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're going somewhere, kids. Stick with the picks. If somebody else wants to start making nuts and saddles, I'd happily partner with you, but I'm not going to start it. Uh, right. Let me find time to um, I have, and I'll tell you this, I, I have been experimenting. Um, this is the first time I've ever mentioned this to anybody. So uh, I have experimented with the hybrid picks of Tagua and resin. Um, I haven't gotten anything to the point where I'm going to be marketing it yet, but um, I'm hoping somewhere down the line that I'll, I'll be able to do something like that um, where, you know, there's a little bit of uh, a nice feel with uh, um, a, a resin plastic at the end with the tone of the Tagua. Um, I know that kind of falls out of the environmental end of it, uh, but I think it might be a cool thing to tie, to tie these two things together. Uh, there's a lot of makers out there right now that are doing it with um, wood um, and other, and you know, straight up just resin picks, and um, they're they're doing pretty good with them. So um, cool. I've been thinking about doing that the same hit thing here. So I have the equipment to do it, just haven't gotten around to the R and D on it. Okay. Well, I think um, we're we're getting close here. To we're trying to keep these about an hour, and um, we're getting okay. close to that. Oh, yeah, we are. Yeah, it was quick. Wow. Yeah, it goes it goes real quick. I have I just want to pop up on the screen. We mentioned the personalized picks a little bit. And I, I want to pop up on the screen the gear section of the website too. So the pick boxes you can buy and the the tumbler mugs. I I love your logo. Uh, you're out of you. extra large t shirts again. I know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and listen, and being and being sequestered with a refrigerator, that size is not going. Yeah, down. I, I've already gained a few. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know that I've been um, eating a lot more leftovers than I ever have. <laughs> so different things yeah. on there that people can check out. But again, also coming on here, you can find more about like kind of the history and what the tag mm-hmm. nut is. You can look at the different artists that you have. So the website is howlingmonkeypicks.com and I can grab that and drop that down in the chat. So if somebody's watching this uh, now or in the lot or in the replay, they could they could click on that. But definitely go out and check out what Brian's doing. I think it's it's really cool and fascinating. And I've been saying to my students at school um, for ages, when they got these laser printers and stuff. I was like, some industrial stu- industrious students going to come in. They're going to find something. They're going to do it. And they're going to make a living at it. You know what I mean? They're yeah. going to, they're good. If they could just put Snapchat away for five minutes. It's, it's the spark. It, right. It's creating that spark. It's you create story. that one spark. Yeah. So this is, I'm going to be, I'm going to be showing students these picks being like, hey, this is what you yeah. can be. I mean, you've given professor hey. beard some nice uh, things to tell his students about. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, think about it. I mean, they, they, they have access, you know, they could open their own Etsy. Not, not that they should be making picks. I won't tell them that, but, yeah. you know, like, you know, think outside the box a little bit, you know, this is a material. I don't know. Is anybody else making tag with picks? Yeah, there are. I have um, three direct competitors that I know of. One actually is in New York as well. Um, I'm not going to mention any names, for obvious reasons, fair enough. Um, <laughs> but there are a few out there. Um, then I, as far as I know, I'm the only guitar pick manufacturer that's doing them exclusively. The other people who are making Tagua picks make other style picks out of other materials, but I'm the only one focused exclusively. Your laser on, on the 
<laughs> I, see, I see what you did there. Yeah, I see what you did there. <laughs> All right. Well, this, I mean, this has been fascinating. It's, it's so funny. Like, this, we, Pat and I have talked about it a hundred times. The YouTube channel thing, when we started this, it was just a way to kind of hang out. And it was never really anything, you know, like, let's hang out, play each other's gear, talk about it. We'll record it. it, it our wives will leave us alone because they think we're doing something productive, whatever. Um, and it's turned into this thing that's really cool. And so, like, this hour is just spent with you learning more about the company is awesome. And I know. Uh, we will probably be mentioning this in future live streams that we're going to be doing as part of this conversation, but forward, you know, we'll be, you know, it, it seems to be what happens once we interview somebody, we find out what's really going on. Like we keep bringing yeah. it up. So I'm hoping we can throw some people your way. Um, yeah. because, uh, this is so cool. Uh, well, but nice thank you. I hope that, um, when, when this is all done, I'm going to share this video to my, my pages and, See if we can get some views up on it too, and get some more people to to check you guys out as well. Okay, okay. great. But uh, I mean, thank you so much for taking the time. I mean, I, I, it's guys. like right now people have some time, but you're still working. I mean, you're still at home. So appreciate you taking some yeah. time out of your day to, to spend an hour with us. And well, I really appreciate you guys reaching out to me too. I really do. Um, and it's been a fun conversation. Uh, 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 way better than I. Um, it went better than I was expecting. Um, <laughs> I was afraid you were going to throw some pure ball questions at me, and I was going to not be able to answer it. <laughs> I was, was going to ask you what your favorite bread was, but I yes. figured that. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite pizza? How about that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Green. I know that one. There you go. All right. <laughs> That's good stuff. But I think with that, are we missing yeah. anything, Pat? I, every time we end one of these five minutes later, I'm like, oh, why did I? Right. I didn't ask that. No, I just echo what Jason said. Thanks for coming on. I think what you're doing is great. I think it's, uh, you know, great that during this time that you're still able to sustain business and things, and that's great. And I know that you're, you know, concerned about people who can't, but happy for you. Glad that you know at this point your family is all healthy and that you're doing this great business that's a sustainable business and supports people in other places of the world that aren't as fortunate as us. I think it's just it's a win-win all the way around. So it was great to meet you and hear the story. So thank you, you for coming on. You too. All right. So Brad with that, I said in the chat, yeah. cool stuff, guys, and thank you, Brad, for hanging out the whole time. There's yeah. most of you that are still hanging out with us. We appreciate you guys popping in, and guys, and potentially gals. But our, we we joke that we know from statistically, we have about 0.1 percent of our following is females. So. <laughs> <laughs> most of our middle aged guys. That's right. <laughs> so, so with that, I'm PJ on behalf of the Beard, reminding you: no matter what you hear, you never have too much gear especially if they have something to do with monkeys. Hey, there you go. <laughs> a monkey can sell anything. <laughs> Two monkeys can run a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> have a great one, everybody. All right, guys. See, see yeah. Oh, my – I haven't hit end yet. My daughter just popped in and said she's on here. That's how yeah. boring life has become for some people. <laughs> He's out. <laughs>